I'm Larry Weeks, and this is Bounce. Conversations about challenge, whether personal or corporate. I try to suss out the tools, tips, or systems that can help us handle them. It's your beliefs about the thought. Can you leave it alone? Can you wait until tomorrow to worry? Can you postpone your worry if you want to? Is it a good idea to worry or do you think it's a bad idea? You think it's it's good for my, you know, I have control over my health. I, I need to spend 10 hours worrying. Otherwise, I won't be able to detect any illness in time and so on. So you have hmm. these positive beliefs about the usefulness of worry. And then you might also have the uncontrollability belief. You don't have a choice about the worry time. You want them to self-regulate. And that is really what we're going for, self-regulation. And you, the only way to make thoughts and feels, feelings self-regulate is to not working on regulating them at all. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Bounce Podcast. I've had a horrible cold for the last week, so please forgive my froggy voice and my occasional cough. As a person who overthinks, I relish practices like bike rides, long walks, meditation, any activity that disengages my chatterbox of a brain, I'm prone to rumination, which is a wonderful capacity for ideas or problem solving, but can quickly become a hammer looking at everything as if it's a nail. And this can lead not only to paralysis by analysis, but also insomnia, excessive worry, and negative moods. My guest on this episode is Dr. Pia Callison, who explains how to use metacognitive strategies to break free from this overthinking. Dr. Callison is a therapist and metacognitive specialist managing several clinics in Denmark. She has a PhD from Manchester University, and she is the author of Live More, Think Less. And her study into the effectiveness of metacognitive therapy for depression, published in Scientific Reports in 2020, suggests that MCT has considerable benefits which can exceed those of CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy. Metacognitive therapy, and I'm excerpting here from Science Direct, has been described as a paradigm shift in psychotherapy. It was developed by Adrian Wells, and it's based on information processing theory and the self-regulatory executive function model. The treatment has been cited in National Health Services guidelines in the UK as a treatment to consider for generalized anxiety. So metacognition is how we think about thinking. This is a form of therapy based on doing less, not more, with your thoughts and feelings. So let me give you an example pulled from uh, Pia's book. And we're all familiar with this kind of tip of the tongue phenomenon. You know, we get a sense of uh, we're trying to remember either a name of a favorite song or we're doing a crossword puzzle and we need to find the word for, let's say, green gemstone. Okay, man, what's that called again? I, ju- I know it. Mm. Uh, we know the word, but for some reason we can't retrieve it from our memory. How can we know that we know the answer but yet be unable to think of it? This is metacognition. Your brain has an overview of the knowledge library it contains, even if we can't access it right away in order to kind of pull from that knowledge. Some people will try to concentrate harder, which is a form of rumination, trying to rummage through the stored knowledge by putting all the energy into thinking about the name of the green gemstone. Others will use a kind of layered or structured strategy like reviewing the entire alphabet. I do this, right? A, B, C, in an attempt to find that name. Now, often, I and I think we've all experienced this, the best strategy is is actually do as little as possible. Just let the question sit there until some level of our mind has dived into the archives for the answer itself. And later, maybe a few minutes later or we're out for a walk or whatever, it will hit us. Jade. Jade is the green gemstone. The point being, most answers and solutions to our Questions don't show up because we ruminate. We're going at it directly with a lot of effort. According to Dr. Callison, our metacognition can do the work completely automatically. This is the self-regulation aspect of our conversation and uh, metacognition. So how does this apply to negative thoughts or stressful thoughts? If we use all our mental powers to ruminate, uh, according to Dr. Callison, we risk maintaining the negative thoughts. They grow stronger. 
We get tangled up with those thoughts, thereby making our mood even worse. So this is a bit of oversimplification, maybe, but it's best to let our thoughts be, and that's what we talk about on this episode. Just passively observe the flow of thought. It's not the number of unpleasant experiences or or negative thoughts that leads to a very negative mood, anxiety, depression. It's the focus as the primary cause. It's the amount of attention we give our thoughts and problems. Simply put, we ruminate ourselves into depression or we worry ourselves into anxiety. Okay, with that said, this is what the show is about. And I discussed that with Dr. Callison. We define metacognition, metacognitive therapy. We talk about metacognitive beliefs, the discovery of self-regulating mechanisms in the brain, how uh, metacognitive therapy differs from CBT in targeting specific psychological processes. How do you postpone worry or rumination? I mean, easier said than done, right? We talk about attention training. We talk about detached mindfulness and the benefits and risks of practicing mindfulness and meditation in conjunction with metacognitive therapy. And that's around the goal-seeking function, the, the, the problem with that. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Pia Kellison. Thank you for, for joining and, and coming on. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm uh, honored that you want to speak to someone from Denmark. <laughs> yeah. I wanted you on because I was trying to locate someone who does uh, metacognitive therapy and or has written about the subject or is a thought leader. You're currently in practice, right? You have a practice. I have a large a clinic with 25 psychologists, and they're either in the way of becoming metacognitive specialists. There's a two-year program, a masterclass that you can, uh, where Adrian Wells, Professor Adrian Wells is teaching because he's the one who developed it. And I, I was a PhD student with him, so I have had a lot of supervision with him and been under his his wings for many years. So, And I'm, I'm a supervisor myself now on this masterclass, so... I would say that, yes, uh, I'm pretty pretty good at metacognitive therapy. <laughs> I was wondering if you were, if, I mean, this book, Live More, Think Less, that you came across, is actually out in Britain, England, Australia, and so on. It's actually quite international, but it's a very small subject. And as you say, there's not many people who's, who are educated in this. It's a new paradigm, and there's no one in the United States. There's one in Australia. There's one in New Zealand. So it's like very, very small Maybe there's 150 in Norway, but then there's 10 in Amsterdam, in the uh, in Netherlands. So they are like situated. And in Denmark, we are 80 people who are um, have this um, certification. Has it had a wider adoption in Europe than the US? Yeah, yeah. That's because uh, Adrian Wells uh, is doing this program with a Norwegian professor called Hans Nordell. So he sends all his students, all the Norwegian students from Trondheim, on the program. So. So that's because of their collaboration that that there's a lot of Norwegian, Swedish, Danish people enrolled. So it's an it's a Scandinavian thing and a little bit European thing. There's about there's some people in in Germany who, who can do it and yeah across Europe, but it hasn't reached America yet. Why, reached why, why do you America. do you think that's a cultural thing or do you think the no. ACT protocol oh. is? taking its play or Act. doing something similar. Act is, is huge. Act is huge. Yeah, well, it's similar, but it's not as evidence-based. And the results are not as, as magnificent as uh, as metacognitive therapy. So it's a matter of time. At time. the moment, okay. they, they're doing it yeah, because they're doing an online masterclass now, a two-year program. And I believe there's four or five American students on that one. So in two years, they will be. So you have you have certified therapists in two years or so. Okay. So I'm, I'm a tennis player. I just want to throw this at you. So I, I play tennis and, and I'm a meditator. There is a little technique when you uh, start losing your cool to say no feeling after a point. So the, the little thing you rehearse, you say no feeling after a point. So you don't celebrate if you win a point and you don't ruminate or criticize yourself if you lose a point. You don't. You try not to get upset either way. The problem with that is you can't stop a feeling. You're going to feel. It's yeah, automatic. Exactly. Right? Right. I was going to say that. I was going to say there's something wrong with that one. <laughs> so, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. in my meditation practice, there is a noting technique. When you meditate, you say uh, hearing, feeling, seeing. There's certain techniques. There's a lot of techniques like that. So, I, I added this little thing. If I lost a point and I felt bad, I feel it immediately. I would say feeling no label. 
So I would just tack on no label. So I'm trying to stop myself from interpreting the feeling and having the thoughts about the feeling, if this makes sense. Yeah, it's still doing something with thoughts. It's still, (laughs) yes, but it's working a lot more than the other one. So what I'm trying, I was trying to figure out why is this, why is this working for me? And it's because I'm not running with, running with Mm. the thoughts. They they certainly want to come. So with, with that as the launching board, first for our audience, because this is, it's intimidating the terminology of metacognitive therapy. It sounds, it sounds metaphysical, or it sounds very, very complicated, right? So, tell us what metacognition is. And I, I think obviously yeah. it, it's thinking about thinking. But tell me if that fits the definition or that. Thinking about thinking, yes, exactly. So, so when you have a trigger situation, it could be internal, like an emotion, or it could be external trigger situation. You would have. A thought you would have the, some trigger thoughts that's very normal so if you don't if, you, if you're losing in tennis you'll have trigger thoughts if you have an, an, an emotion you don't like you'll have trigger thoughts and so uh, you have some beliefs about those uh, thought handling you, you you either believe that you can leave the thought alone if you want to you don't believe you can leave the thought alone it's uncontrollable or you believe it's useful so you, so you can have some metacognitive beliefs about how to handle this thought and what are the good strategies and the bad strategies and what strategies can I choose? You know, can can I can I leave the thought alone? Is that an option really? So so you have some beliefs about thoughts, what what they are, and and if they should be handled or not, and if you have a choice about handling them, and all these th- uh, beliefs about thoughts are yeah metacognitive beliefs, and that's what we work on in metacognitive therapy. Oh, okay, so it's the aspect of what you think about thoughts or thinking about thinking. What do you think about your thoughts? Example, you have OCD and you think, if I have pedophilic thoughts, I will become a pedophilic person. I will, uh, you know, I'll attack children if I don't control this thought. So you believe the thought is dangerous. If you have OCD, for example, you believe a violent thought uh, of killing your partner or whatever is a dangerous thought. Because if I have, if I have health anxiety, I'm going to have a heart attack. And here it comes. Yeah, this- that could be if you have a health anxiety OCD, you would believe that the thoughts can kill you. But you might also believe that you can't control how much time you spend on your health anxiety thoughts. So if you have a trigger thought, let's say you feel something in your body and you think oh, it's cancer or is this dangerous, then you might think I can't control how much time I spend worrying about this thought. I can't control it. It's not in, under my control if I spend half an hour, if I spend 10 hours. I just worry. It's uncontrollable. So, so it's not the thought itself. Okay, I'm going to have a heart attack. So I'm feeling tightness across my chest. I'm going to have a heart attack, even though uh, you don't, and this is repeated. It's not the thought. No, it's your beliefs about the thought. Can you leave it alone? Can you wait until tomorrow to worry? Can you postpone your worry if you want to? Is it a good idea to worry or do you think it's a bad idea? You think it's it's good for my, you know, I have control over my health. I, I need to spend 10 hours worrying. Otherwise, I won't be able to detect any illness in time and so on. So you have hmm. these positive beliefs about the usefulness of worry. And then you might also have the uncontrollability belief. You don't have a choice about the worry time. So you're in a dilemma. So, you are ambivalent in a way. Yes. Are these both conscious and, and subconscious? Well, they are conscious and you can easily get hold of them in therapy. I would ask patients, you know. How I'm assuming in the moment. I'm, I mean, in the moment of, yeah. of... They would know. They would know. They'd say, I don't have control. I can't control it. You know, they they will verbalize how uncontrollable this worry feels and so on. So they are much aware of it, but they haven't really been asked these questions before on a meta level. In this way. Okay. So this is a form of therapy based on really doing less, not more with how you're thinking exactly. and your feelings. This is more. Exactly. Yeah. Less is more. Even more. Yeah, because you want them to self-regulate, and that is really what we're going for: self-regulation. And you, the only way to make thoughts and feels, feelings self-regulate is to not working on regulating them at all. Okay. So you want to do do less is more, or as Adrian Wells says, doing nothing is doing everything. You want to do oh. as little with the thought as possible. Very interesting. So I'm glad you mentioned self-regulating. So let's talk about that. So. There's a signal sent to the brain that leads to feeling distressed or whatever, right? The signal it might be short, or, or I think the theory of self-regulation is it, it's short. So you have these uncomfortable feelings, but they don't last long in the human mind. They, they We may think they will, but we prolong it. We prolong exactly. these uncomfortable feelings with whatever unhelpful what? coping strategy we have. So that means the feelings are going to last longer in the mind. And is the theory then that self-regulating means 
the brain is able to kind of process it itself on its own and exactly. and it will pass if we leave them alone yes so the 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 intrusion will pass the negative emotion will pass the negative thought will pass if we don't work on it and if we don't fight it and and you know any fight is really bad in metacognitive therapy it's pushing it away it's dwelling on it ruminating any active so it's like lazy therapy. You want to be as lazy as possible to 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 leave it alone to self. You're wrestling with a pig. You're going to get dirty. Yeah. So you want to be lazy. You just want to observe and then wait for it to 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 self regulate. So there doesn't seem any room in that therapy or or that concept for any kind of cognitive behavioral strategies. There doesn't seem any room. So in other words, thought disputing or, hey, that's oh, no, irrational. No, no, no. That, would be, that would be the bad thing. That would be that would be doing something. That would be prolonging the thought if you work on it with rational thinking and restructuring. I did that a lot for the first 10 years when I was a CBT therapist. So there's no room for that. Is there, how about downstream? If you Is want there... to get rid of your depression. I mean, if you want the shortest way out of depression and anxiety and disorders, you don't want to, you don't want to prolong them. So, so the theory here is that these prolonged disorders are only prolonged normal fluctuations. So you'd have a bad day. If you don't want that to develop into depression, you want to leave it alone. <laughs> if you have an anxiety attack and you don't want to develop this to panic attack, you want to leave it alone. So if you don't want disorders, you know, diagnosis, the best strategy is leaving these uh, emotions and thoughts that will appear alone so you don't hold on to them and prolong them to a diagnosis. Okay. So let's say once we're clear of the negative emotion or, or emotions aren't as high, you know, let's say we're at a 10 scale, right? Where I, I'm freaking out. I've let it alone. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the techniques here, right? Because we're going to need help. Yeah. That I'm sure leaving it alone is not an easy thing. So with that said, let's say we we do it and now I'm I'm calm, I'm fine. Is there any benefit in me looking at some of the cognitive behavioral labeling of thoughts, predicting emotional reasoning is there any benefit in learning what those are as to what my mind's doing or is there any benefit in knowing the various irrational thoughts that can pop up during those emotional swings the goal in metacognitive therapy is is, is is seeing that you can leave a thought alone and and an impact alone a trigger thought independent of mm. its content so you don't need to know the content to, to learn that you can choose to leave this alone. So, so it wouldn't give you any insight. I mean, you, of course you can know yourself better. Okay. I get these trigger thoughts and they, but it doesn't really change. You need to, to um, see that you can leave them alone independent. If it's that hmm. kind of negative thought on that. Sometimes well, this... it's realistic. Sometimes it's not, you know, it's, it's a real thought. Maybe you had cancer and you have a, a risk of dying. I mean, sometimes these thoughts are not irrational. They can be true. Well, this is very interesting because I think when I was reading about uh, metacognitive therapy, I was trying to fit it in with the, all the other therapies as a, some kind of rubric here. And what's interesting, I thought it was specifically dealing with the rumination part or the extended part of negative thinking. It sounds like it's pretty much on a continuum at any level, whatever the depression, anxiety. So we have we have a mixed groups online mixed groups in English too, but we have people with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and so on. Wow. And they use different strategies, but the, 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 I mean, it's the same. So the depressed people will ruminate 10 hours. The PTSD people will push away their intrusions, their traumatic uh, Im images, will try to push them away 10 hours a day. <laughs> and the <clears throat> anxiety people will worry about the next anxiety attack. 10 hours a day. So these are different strategies, but we can have them in one group and, and actually do therapy with them for six weeks in one group because they quickly see that you might ruminate, I might push thoughts away, you might uh, worry. Mm. It's, it's handling thoughts. It's just um, thought handling all around. So is there chicken or egg here? Are anxiety and depression linked? Is it your opinion that they are one and the same, just different sides? To the same thing? That, that's just byproducts of, of overthinking, overhand, Doesn't overhandling. Doesn't matter. Okay. So if you, uh, have to, if, you, um, if you worry a lot, you get anxiety. If you ruminate a lot, you, you feel depressed. So it's just the, the byproduct of a, a certain thought handling technique. So if you if you do uh, pushing away thoughts a lot, you will feel tense and anxiety. If you ruminate a lot, you will feel depressed and low. So it's just what happens when you do a certain 
uh, thought handling strategy too much. So I come to you. I have high anxiety. What What do you What What, what do you recommend? I go through uh, in slow motion the recent episode to find the trigger thought. When did it happen? Was it from the morning? Did you wake up and and you felt ten? I mean, what? How did it happen? And so I would find the trigger point. You know, when was the impact? When did you start feeling bad? And what did you do with with that feeling? So what would you do with that thought that that came to your head? So let's you, say I wake up and I have some anxiety. So let's say I've 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 identified what what the thought is. Do I need to identify the trigger? Like something happened. Well, it's just a, it's just Does, a, a starting point, and then you would ask them the real big question, the interesting question: What did you do with that thought? That's the important question, because the, you, just to have a starting point, it could be anything. What if I get fired? What if I get yes. another panic attack? Yes. What if my mom doesn't love me anymore? What if my, my wife is unfaithful? Whatever. Yes. But that's not the important part. It's just to have a starting point. The important question is, what did you do with that thought? Did you leave it alone or did you do something with it? And then, That's an interesting question. What did I do with the thought? And what you mean by that is, did I keep thinking about it? Well, did you leave it alone? It could be there the whole day. Did you just let it hang there? Or did you try to push it away? Or did you just let it hang? Were you lazy towards it? <laughs> Were you lazy towards the thought? Or did you tr- tr- try to um, do something with it? Try to plan ahead. It could be a planning process where you plan. So if this happened, then I will do that. If that happens, I will do that. Okay. So it's like a planning process. That's a great question. I think I do two or three things. I try to plan. So let's say I, I, I tried to plan. I also tried to push it away. And I also, mm-hmm. let's say I don't know any techniques of how to deal with this. It just sat in the mm-hmm. back and bothered me all day. Like it just sat there and it it, mm-hmm. it just ran in the background. I think that's for my case. It would just run. I It would go away, come back, go, come. Would you let just let it I didn't do go, much with it. I didn't do much with it. I let it kind of... Okay, you didn't, didn't go into a dialogue with it. You didn't try to discuss with it. You just let it talk without answering it. You know what? I think I would probably do future planning. I think I would try to like, okay, if this happens, then B, what's C, right? I think that's what I... That's an active process. So active. I would ask, okay. so how, much, how much time do you spend working on the on planning? Because planning is not leaving it alone and being lazy. That's doing something. So how much time would you spend planning? Is it just 10 minutes or is it more hours? Man, it could be time? hours. So if you spend many hours planning, how did that make you feel? What Did you feel happier, lower, more anxious, less anxious? Heavier. What symptoms? No change in the feeling, just heavy, just just exo- heavy. just a little wore out, you know, just tired. Okay, so I would then connect the, the, the dots here. So do you think it's the uh, the trigger thoughts that are talking to you that is draining you the most or the working on the planning? So is it the the existence of the trigger thoughts? Or it's the, the thoughts. Planning it's the trigger thing? thoughts, I think. It's the trigger yeah, that's thoughts. Interesting. Yeah. And then I would kind of talk a little bit more and say, so if you didn't work on planning, would you be as strained? If we played with the thought that you didn't plan, you were able to not plan. The thoughts were there, what's going to happen in the future, but you didn't plan on them. They were still hanging there, but you didn't do the planning. Would you be as strained, do you think, if you didn't do the planning? Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Would I be so less thoughts, drained? You didn't plan. Okay. If you didn't so, plan an hour. Oh, I'm digging my own grave, aren't I, Dr. Callison? I'm, I'm digging a hole for <laughs> my... I'm digging a hole that... It's harder, <laughs> deeper and deeper. So part of me wants yeah. to say, no, part of me wants to say that what if I felt better by finding a, a plan B? Because that is possible. Like I, oh, you know, yeah. I was planning, planning. I was like, oh, okay, then if I do mm. B, maybe the worst won't happen. Mm. So that's that's possible. Mm. I, But I just can't tell you if so, I can find the plan B. But let's say I did. Mm. What if I did? Does that matter? Yeah, so you'd hate what I hear is a uh, positive belief about the usefulness of planning because uh, the planning helps me uh, avoid um, negative thoughts. I can. I, I can see. Use, You're uh, finding my metacognitive beliefs. So I can hear that you think there's some usefulness in it. And I can ask you, okay, so do you think it's primarily useful because it gives you some insight and you are ahead of time and you don't get surprises and you don't make mistakes? Or do you think it's a negative thing because it drains you, it it gives you these symptoms, you are tired? So do you think... I think it protects me because I am doing something. I feel like this worry is propelling me to take some action and I'm taking that action. Okay, if this happens, if A happens, I'll do B. If B happens, I'll do C, whatever. I feel like intellectually that it's helping me. So you're willing to pay the price of draining and anxiety and... 
energy level and, and i mean it's the price worth it's worth the price you think probably not well now that you put it that way i don't know you could do an experiment i mean you know what you have what if you realized with experiments that you would get the same action and you could still do things and not do things without with less worry would that help yes you if okay you so that's what that's that's the other thing i didn't say is that in my mind i'm thinking I should probably postpone the planning till I'm hmm. in a calmer state. I, I don't feel like I make good decisions when I'm hyper emotional anyway. So hmm. I try to postpone anything, any big decisions. When I, so, hmm. so to the point, I was thinking, was it all that helpful to try to plan when I'm at a high emotional state? That's so why. are you able to wait till tomorrow? I mean, can you? Well, that's why I'm talking to you. How do I do that? Yeah, that's a can, uncontrollability. So that's the isn't that's the that a ability. technique? Isn't that one of the techniques you have or suggestions, right? Of postponing waiting for. The and yeah. when I read that, that, when I read one of those techniques, uh, Dr. Callison, I was like, mm -hmm. "How does one do that? You know, is that?" Can someone well, do that? first of all, you need to uh, to work on uncontrollability. That means that you want that you realize that you are able to leave the thought alone until five o'clock. So it's 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 connected to the uncontrollability belief. So in order to do that, to wait until five o'clock, you need to be, to believe it's an option that you have a choice that you are able to leave a thought, emotional thought, alone, and wait to work on it and be lazy towards it. So then again, we have a, a choice situation. Can you choose to be lazy towards a negative thought and emotion because it's it's still there? Lazy doesn't mean emotionless or thoughtless. Lazy just means you don't you're not working on it. So like like I, usually I, I make a, a metaphor like a, there's a dish standing there you have it you have an unwashed dish yeah then you can look at the dish <laughs> the unwashed do you call that in, in the United States so you look at, yeah. at the, mm -hmm. the plates and all that and it's it's dirty yeah so you can either fix it like you know wash your dishes up or you can just be looking at it and can you choose if you take the if you wash the dishes or just look at it and it's the same here so you you have the thoughts you have the emotions there on planned you didn't you haven't planned them you haven't worried on them can you choose to do nothing with them just look at them and wait to work on them would you be able to choose that i think so yes so this is interesting because if i'm feeling some heavy negative emotion depression anxiety i feel it in my chest and i feel mm -hmm. these physical sensations pushing me to do something and then a part of me you know my brain is like What's going on? What is going on? Mm -hmm. You're saying to feel that, but don't just postpone. Just postpone the interpretation of that. Don't yeah, the answer, the answering of it. So the it's like answering of that. Ringing. The phone is ringing. Your, your mind is saying, "What is this? What is this? What you need to do something with it? You need to do something." So your mind might be talking to you like the, the phone ringing, but you don't answer thoughts. So you might still have a lot of thoughts bombarding you. What are you going to do now? Oh my God, you feel very bad. Oh, you have a, and you have the emotions, you have the physical sensations. So you have the whole impact, but you're instructing yourself to leave it alone. It's there, but you're hmm. continue your plan. If you have other plans, you do that. You don't, you don't do anything special with it. You just continue your everyday life and wait to do something with, if it's still there three hours later. So you, so it's, it's there and you let it be. Is this the crux of the therapy? is the ability to let those thoughts and then you be realize, so you practice that and then it, at a certain point you realize that three hours later it's gone it's self-regulated and you don't need to plan and worry and so on so often you'd by leaving it alone you you will feel this self-regulation you will experience it on your own body so the thoughts stop calling you and the physical sensations kind of slowly self-regulate is it too trite to say the way out is through yeah, the way out is doing nothing. This is very interesting, uh, Dr. Kalisa. So, so tell me, what do you do then? So, so is do you okay, pick so a time and say, okay, at five o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to yeah. revisit? Yeah, it's not mandatory. So, if it's gone, if it's self-regulated, you need to you don't need to drag it up again and start working on it. So, you can choose at five o'clock. Okay, do I need to plan now? Maybe it's still there. It's still. Mm -hmm. uh, Bothering you, you can plan. But if it's self-regulated, you don't need to do it. It's not mandatory. You wait okay. until tomorrow. So are there techniques on how to postpone? That is the, the, the detached mindfulness. So the detached mindfulness is the opposite of doing something with thoughts and feelings. So detached mindfulness is not an empty mind. So you still have 60,000 thoughts a day. 
a detached mindfulness is not, is not an empty body, so you still have sensations, you still have strong emotions. Detached mindfulness is just observing these uh, thoughts and feelings and sensations without doing something with them. So that is the practice in session and between sessions. So you would practice with neutral thoughts first, like a pink elephant thought or whatever, like a thought that doesn't really trigger any emotions. So I would ask you to kind of have a, a neutral thought, like a pink elephant thought, and then practice leaving it alone. That's not pushing it away or just observing and doing nothing with that pink elephant thought. And that would be quite easy for you. I think you could do that, right? So it's an easy thing if I ask you to have a thought of a tiger and you just leave it alone. No problem. So the next step would be realizing that you can do this with really uncomfortable thoughts. I mean, independent of how strong the emotion is, how uncomfortable the thought is, how, yeah, independent, if it's the most scary uh, horror movie thought or whatever, you can choose to observe and do nothing with it. It doesn't mean it's not there. You, you have emotions. So I would then ask you to practice on your trigger thoughts in the session. So that would be, oh my God, what if I don't get my deadline? Oh my God, what if I get fired? Whatever trigger thought that you mentioned. And I would kind of throw them at you. And then you need to practice doing nothing with whatever happens inside you. So I would say, first I'll start with neutral thoughts, you know, pink elephants, or tigers, or rainforest, whatever. And then you just, you know, can you yeah, I can observe them. And then I would kind of drag in some of those trigger thoughts to make you realize that you can continue observing independent of if the thought doesn't trigger you at all or if it really triggers you you know you get a heartbeat and you get a really a physical uncomfortable but you can still just observe it and when you could do it in the session the homework would be practicing in a real trigger situation so you would expose yourself to something trigger something that makes you trigger and practice leaving it alone this to me sounds like a form of awareness training it seems to me it, it's crucial to be aware of what the thoughts are. Is it? Well, you just need well, not really. You really just need to to know that you can leave it alone if you want to. So it's more uncontrollability experiments. So it's it's like a behavioral experiment testing: is it possible for me to have thoughts and feelings and do nothing with them? Is it possible? So it's more a behavioral experiment. Well, then, then let me ask you this: if I'm not aware of what the thoughts are, because it's this has happened to me before, where I'm feeling depressed or anxious, whatever it is. And I can't readily identify what the thought is that I'm feeling. So what do you do in those cases? Just feel yeah, it. And- because Yeah. The, the, the main, the big, the, you know, the important stuff here is, are you able to leave it alone without knowing what the trigger thought is? Can you still okay. choose to leave it without knowing the trigger? thought? So, so you don't have to know, you don't have to know the trigger thoughts. Okay. The main part is, can you choose to leave it alone even if you don't know it, I mean, if you know the trigger thought, if you don't know it, is it a choice for you to wait until five o'clock and and analyze why was I triggered or whatever it is? Yeah. Okay, so that that's the crux of my tennis technique that I think is working. I'm acknowledging that I feel something, you know, upset, whatever, I'm acknowledging, but I don't engage with the thinking about it, which that is helping. I, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely finding a, a, a new way around the choking and whatever happens in the in the middle of this game, you know, you're you're helping me kind of frame what what exactly I'm I'm on to here with this. It sounds like it's uh, what would happen if you didn't if you didn't do the mantra thing. You have this uh, don't label it, don't label it. Why would happen? What would happen if you didn't do that? What, if you didn't here's what's interesting. Yeah, what here's what's interesting. The, when I say no feeling, no label, it just gives my brain something to to think about. It's kind of a door to the thoughts on what I'm feeling. I don't know how, but it's it's just giving me something to think about versus I just lost that mm-hmm. point. I'm playing terribly because what happens is I have a feeling and then I started talking to myself as to what that feeling, what's going on. Oh, you're playing lousy. Mm-hmm. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. Why did you do that? It's, you know, it's mm-hmm. this. And as soon as I let those thoughts come in, it's a string. The thoughts are never one. As soon as I let one in, it's a flood. I'm just curious, does these thoughts happen on themselves, on them on their own? All these negative thoughts, are they just happening on their on their own without an effort? Or are these thoughts that you're producing with effort and with I mean, are you are you hitting yourself in the head? No, like it's they're pretty automatic. So what would happen if you let the free flow happen? So if you didn't try to control it with the no label, no emotion, <laughs> if you didn't try to control uh-huh. it, what would happen? Then these thoughts will come. And what do you think will happen in the long run if you let them come? 
and you I'm didn't gonna try find to out. stop. I'm going to try this. I'm going to find out. So my point is that if these thoughts are happening on themselves, by themselves, on their mm-hmm. own, without an mm-hmm. effort, these are just associations. So you mm-hmm. do you you do a bad uh, tennis play, and then you have these negative thoughts, and they they kind of have their own life, and they're just yes. uh, you know they have their own life, so on. So in metacognitive therapy, you you let these negative thoughts live their own life. You won't try to stop them. You will just let them live out. There. I mean, you, you would just. But you'd be very aware, are these th- thoughts happening by themselves? Or am I doing some work on them? Am I using uh, energy? Yeah. I, am I using any energy? Mm-hmm. Or am I pretty lazy here with the negative thoughts just bombarding me? That's kind of the awareness that you want to be able to know. And then you okay. want to choose the latest one. Even if you have negative thoughts, and you have, maybe you, yeah, they'll, they'll live some time and then they will pass and then your brain will stop. Okay. Like, like you have a song on your head, it will stop playing in your head. How do we... So it's training. You have to, I can't do this in the moment. I have to train prior to this happening. Is that well, right? It's more, I can do it, but I haven't done it in the right way normally. Normally people will quite quick, quickly realize I have a choice. I can actually leave it alone if, if I don't okay. work on it. Okay, so just they, don't, let's talk about that. Sorry. So I, I have the thought, I'm mindful of it. What's the leaving it alone part? Here's my worry. As soon as I'm aware of it, I'm going to get muddy. I'm going to engage with it. It just seems like it's right there. How, how do I... Uh, yeah, not fuse with I would, it. Uh, usually, I would demonstrate with a contrast ex- exercise. So I would usually first start uh, trying to use a lot of energy on it. So what you usually would do, so I would, I would, I would show you what the difference is by like a contrast exercise. So in the first point, we will work a lot with the thought, do what you usually do, maybe even put more effort in. So I would ask you to get the negative thoughts in your mind. And then start working on them, what you usually would do. So oh, really spend a lot of energy contrast. On what you you're do. contrasting. Okay. And then the next two, first two minutes, you know, and then you would do uh, no, no emotion. No How do you work yourself up? How, you know, so go, work yeah. yourself so, up, so right? How do you work? Uh, yeah. yeah you do and what's the usually, opposite? And then you go, what's the opposite of that? You know? Exactly. And then I would do the next two minutes, do less, you know, have the negative thoughts again, you know, put them in your mind. Okay, they're there. And now you do less with them. So I would show you so you can have the feeling, so you know you can feel the difference between spending energy on the thoughts and being more lazy to them. Is this how, you know, the the psychedelics and there's there's new modes of therapy for um, depression and anxiety. Is that how they work by just helping you physiologically do what you're what, what you're explaining, just to not engage? Okay. I'm know. just curious, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, it maybe blocks the 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 CAS, the the cognitive attentional syndrome. I'm not sure. The the working on thoughts, the thought handling, maybe. So, I don't know. So is detached mindfulness the same thing as attention training? It's just a different. No, word no, for no. It? That's, that's very different. That's very different. And you would actually only do the attention training with depressed patients. So in my anxiety book, that's not translated to English yet. There's no attention training because the anxiety people use the attention training to get rid of emotions, to get calmer. So so uh, that's not the same risk with the depressed patients. They don't have this active goal of getting rid of emotions, getting rid of strong emotions. So, so the attention training would only be for the depressed patients because they are low in awareness and they have don't have any active goals of getting rid of emotions or anything. They just have very, very strong internal focus. So they need to be forced external with attention training. So that's for depressed patients, the attention training. So for the anxiety people, uh, you would practice leaving thoughts alone, like we did now. As, like I said, you know, I'm saying some words, mm-hmm. neutral words, bigger words, and you would practice leaving it alone until you believe you can. Um, and you do contrast exercises until you believe you can choose if you work on it or not. So that would be more doing nothing exercises with the anxiety people. Uh, so you wouldn't introduce attention training with the anxiety, not, not in the first no, no, that would. Be- so let's talk about depression. What are the depressed people doing differently than those that are suffering from anxiety? Yeah. Well, they are ex- extreme internal focus all the time, and they have this. The rumination is like a a, a question: oh, Why? Why am I like this? Why? And even to the point where they have stopped ruminating, but they just have internal focus without any mental processes. They are just like an internal focus all day long. Yeah, so this internal focus, either maybe they've ruminated so much that their, their brain is just pff, the apathy. You know, there's there's no not even thinking more. They're not even thinking anymore. They just have they're in this uh, bubble, internal bubble focus, and that is maintaining the depression, and it could maintain it for years. So in order to to kind of block this internal focus, 
you do attention training where you force their attention external. So you would say, focus all your attention on uh, sounds on your right side, and you would kind of force their attention to the right side outside themselves. Put all your attention to all the sounds you can hear on your left side outside yourself. Even if there's no thoughts, they still need to kind of focus on the area. And by, by doing that three times a day, we have research saying that you can actually pull people from an extremely low, very, very severe depression to a moderate depression, just by pure external training, focus training three times a day. That's really impressive. Hmm, that is so you probably choose that, uh, you know, instead of the electric. How about shock. identifying colors? Oh, that's blue. That's green. That's yeah, a red. So that that? Be, three times, okay. Okay, three times. A day. Well, they, we have actually, they've actually done some research and sounds are the best mod modality. Oh, that's tried interesting. With Hours, I tried with, uh, you know, feeling. They tried, but the the sound. Yeah. Uh, training, There's a bird. Looking, I hear a plane. Okay, that's interesting. All this area sounds in this area. So that's the best uh, way to train it, and that's what you do three times a day. And if you do that with severe depressed patients, it could be you know, in an in ward. I mean, really, they're really depressed. You could kind of drag them up from a very, 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 very bad pit where they can't even get therapy because you can't talk to them, they're too internal focused, mm -hmm. to a moderate level where you can do metacognitive therapy, talk about trigger thoughts, talk about strategies. Then you do the, the, the case formulation, you know, what is the starting point? What was the first thought? What did you do with the thought? Did mm -hmm. you leave it alone? Did you work on the thought? And what? how much time did you spend? And how did that make you feel? I mean, this whole case formulation, getting the dots together, understanding this in a metacognitive way. So it's not the negative thoughts, but it's all the handling that's maintaining the depression. This kind of socialization, we call it, where you psychoeducate what the problem is. Okay. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, and by the way, I certainly understand this is a, a lot more involved in, in therapy, and I'm certainly encouraging people to, to seek that therapy, but just get a handle on this and kind of shorthand. But so if I'm majorly depressed, I can lift my mood a bit by external attention awareness directing my attention and then if i do that i can understand or realize as the negative thoughts become conscious as to what's thing not to engage with them not to, to leave them alone not to try to address them you can use the other stra strategies at that point so then mindfulness meditation it sounds like you would be pro that that's a beneficial depending on how you do the no, mindfulness not meditation. Really, not really, I mean, uh, I mean, less is more in metacognitive therapy. And usually when you ask, when people are using mindfulness, they have this, they have a goal of becoming calmer, getting rid of negative uh, tension. Oh, that can, and, that, so that goal seeking that. is problematic. Yeah, yeah they, they kind of want to regulate th something that needs to self-regulate. So sometimes people use mindfulness to regulate something, to get rid of, tenseness, negative, mm. I mean, you want negative thoughts to pass. I often hear people who do mindfulness saying, well, then I do this, but then the negative thoughts pass. So they have this goal of the thoughts passing, the thoughts moving on. And so that's not really just leaving them be and leaving them hang there. Mm. <laughs> so they have a goal of thoughts moving on, emotions, uh, you know, a calmness in my body. And there's a lot of exercises in mindfulness that are very internal, like focusing on your breathing, focusing on your body. So that would kind of prolong these variations in, in bodily sensations and so on. We, we wouldn't want more internal focus like, like they, they practice in mindfulness. And also mindfulness in itself, I mean, it's two, two different modalities. And, yes. and you, you just practice mindfulness, but it's more like a chance if you can do it in, in real life crisis. <laughs> so you might be able to leave thoughts alone when you do the mindfulness practice, but that doesn't mean you can leave it alone when your boyfriend breaks up with you, when you get fired, when you have strong emotions. That's more chance than, you know, if you can do the same in those situations like you can do in mindfulness, because in mindfulness, you don't work with uncontrollability like we do in metacognitive therapy. So in mindfulness, you wouldn't get questions like, can you leave it alone even if you have strong emotions, even if this happens tomorrow when you are to the exam, can you leave it alone? I mean, you don't work on uh, on this kind of uh, uncontrollability beliefs like you do in metacognitive therapy. Is there part of this therapy having people trust the self-regulating aspects of, of the mind? In other words, getting them to believe or listen, these things are temporary and will pass if you if you trust that they will. 
Yeah, yeah, but that's the experience. I mean, people do their behavioral experiments, waiting until five o'clock, uh, practicing leaving thoughts alone. Then they come back and say, you know what? It just disappeared. So they will get these self-regulation experiences by these experiments. Yeah. I think that's probably, it would seem to be a one of the larger problems here is people not understanding the self-regulating aspect of, of the mind I, because it almost seems unbelievable. Very provocative because let's say you had you had PTSD for 20 years. Yes. And then someone on the cognitive comes and say, Well, you kept it going yourself. You know, what? I mean, it's very provocative too. Like, like you you kept this going. The reason why this wound didn't heal, didn't self-heal, self-regulate, is because your strategies kept this you were PTSD at going. It. Yeah. That, that's a bit provocative, you can say that you kept your depression going, you, you kept your PTSD going. And to a lot of people, it's more than a bit provocative. I mean, that's it's yeah. <laughs> But the, but the good news is that you can actually stop this prolong. I mean, you can get out of it. But of course, it's also a bit, yeah. So it's it's little, um, yeah. So so it's a good news if you really think about it. It's good news. But it's good news. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, but a part of me is like, good. it seems too simple. Is there anything that I didn't mention that we should? I think you had some good questions, and we talked about detached mindfulness, the solution, and a lot of people like the metaphors. Are happy with the metaphors? The telephone ringing, you leave it alone. Uh, yeah, I love that. That was great. Undone, the undone dishwasher, just observing the undone dishes without doing anything with them. So these kind of, what does it mean to do nothing with it? I mean, we have the mosquito metaphor. Can you just let the mosquito bite? I mean, you can you just let it itch without scratching it, without doing anything with it. So we use some metaphors to describe what is what is the what is the solution, the metacognitive solution, and and to realize it's possible no matter how strong the emotion are. As we wrap this up, tell me, is it making it inroads here in the US? Is it a matter of more research that needs to be done here? Or or is it do you know? Well, it- we, we, we do a lot of therapy and we have the online met, uh, metacognitive groups in English. We do one-to-one therapy with people from Bahamas. We even have those and we have from the United States and Australia and so on. So so more and more people are getting the therapy and that means that more and more people are asking for it. So psychologists, psychiatrists want to do education in this. And there's an online two-year program with Professor Adrian Wells who did the program, so who did metacognitive therapy, who developed it. So you can also get training. You don't need to move to Europe or travel to Europe. So you can take the program online if you're a health anxiety person or if you're working with with health, yeah, like a nurse or doctor or whatever. So give us those resources. Is it your website? And by the way, people in the U.S. can contract with therapists overseas? Online, we have a lot of, okay. I mean, after Corona, under Corona, we got really good. Uh, Everybody did, yeah. Online. So that's the good thing, yeah. So point people to your website and your, yeah. your books online. Any other yeah. resources? There's a lot of podcasts. Uh, there's a few in English, but most of them are in Danish, unfortunately. Um, Metacognitive podcast where you can hear the therapy happening, but that's in Danish. So I'm, I'm afraid there's only the books and there's the therapy online groups. And then there's a Facebook website, Live More, Think Less, where you can ask questions and have help from people who've had the, the therapy and new people who help each other. Basically. Yeah, I'm going to point people to uh, Live More, Think Less. Is there any other books of yours or others that we should recommend. Translated. No, I mean they're they're translated to German and the Netherlands, but that anxiety book, unfortunately, is not translated to English yet. I have three books in total: the depression book that's translated into English, the anxiety book, and then I have a book for pa- parents who have worried children. <laughs> so, like a huh. parent book. Oh, that'll be great, Dr. Kleeson. Thank you so much for for coming on. Okay. Take care. Thank, thank you again. You. Bye bye. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com. And we will talk again soon. Mm -hmm.